If you hadn't noticed, I'm a knight. Hello, I'm Knight Jake, host of the Amati Fortress Radio Podcast, and welcome to Movie Gripes. Hello and welcome to Movie Gripes. On the last edition of Movie Gripes, we looked at the 2003 Luther movie. On today's edition of Movie Gripes, we're going to be looking at the 1953 movie Martin Luther. In doing so, we're going to be comparing the two movies to see which does better. Eric Till's 2003 Luther movie or Irving Pickles' 1953 Martin Luther movie. What are you doing? Four years work for nothing? You you can't just give up. Can't I? My dear Spalatin. Some people in my Imagine this gripe in the 2003 Luther movie gripes. Luther and Spalatin didn't meet two years after Luther had already left Erfurt. This is a grand university. If you are fortunate, you may see with your own eyes the Holy Father. Julius II, the Supreme Pontiff. This is a gripe I missed when I did the other Luther movie, but both Luther movies make the same mistake. They both implied that Pope Julius II was in Rome while Luther was visiting. Most likely, Pope Julius II was actually in Pisa at a council. to see and do in Holy Rome. And since the older Martin Luther movie gets a gripe for this, I think it's only fair that the 2003 Luther movie also gets a gripe for this. If only everybody could understand these words, how much better they would understand God's righteousness. And what, dear brother, is God's righteousness? Exactly what scripture says, Father, that it delivers and does not merely judge. Rather, Luther did not understand righteousness like this until he'd been studying at Wittenberg for some time. At this point, he still saw God's righteousness as God's just judgment upon us wicked sinners and that we did not deserve salvation. Luther failed to see how a just and righteous God could actually have mercy upon us and forgive us because if God was just and righteous, he therefore must punish sin and not forgive us. Uh, what's Stelpitz doing there? Stelpitz left Wittenberg in 1512 and moved to live in the south of Germany, although he did keep his title of Vicar General until 1520. I'd like to give one gripe for this entire scene simply because I don't think this conversation took place. Mainly because, as I said before, Stelpitz wasn't in Wittenberg at this time. When Luther came to Wittenberg, uh, Stelpitz in 1512 moved to the south of Germany and was not in Wittenberg. However, I do like this scene for a number of reasons. One, because even though Stelbridge did have a true understanding of the gospel, and his understanding of the gospel uh, helped contribute to Luther's own understanding of what law and gospel mean, uh, Stelbridge did still believe in indulgences and relics and the Pope and stuff like this. Uh, another reason why I like this scene is because it actually talks about Luther's finding God's salvation in Romans 1 in the righteousness of God while he was working on his lectures. And here in my room, I've been preparing my lectures on the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. And here, I think I've found the truth at last. And when I found it, it was as though the gates of heaven were opened to me. Romans 117. Nope. The Bible wasn't divided into verses and chapters until 1551. You stitch here in him day, for the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so? Worthy vicar, do we find anything here of relics? 
By faith man lives and is made righteous, not by what he does for himself. Be it adoration of relics, singing of masses, pilgrimages to Rome, purchase of pardon for his sins, but by faith in what God has done for him already through his son. Dr. Martin, if you leave the Christian to live only by faith, if you sweep away all good works, all these glorious things you dismiss as mere crutches, what will you put in their place? Christ. Man only needs Jesus Christ. Luther didn't add a loan to this verse until he translated the New Testament into German. In 1517, young Prince Albert of Brandenburg, who was already bishop of two German provinces, sent his brother to Rome to arrange for a third appointment. First, we granted him the Archbishopric of Magdeburg when he was well under age. Then, a dispensation to hold a second benefice, the Archbishopric of Halberstadt. <laughs> This is a common misconception. Uh, Albert of Mainz was Archbishop of Magdeburg, but at this point in time he was only Bishop of Halberstadt. Plenaria remissio omnium peccatorum. What does that mean? Full forgiveness for all sins. Absolution from all punishments. No confession necessary. That's incorrect. The indulgence that Tetzel was selling actually specified that a person's indulgence was only valid once the buyer went to confession. When, with a piece of silver, he can set her free. For as soon as the money clinks in the chest, the soul flies up to heavenly rest. That's not his slogan. His slogan was, When the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Or in German, So wie das Geld im Kassen klingt, des Seele aus dem Fegführer springt. I'm sorry if I butchered that, I don't really speak German. Now I actually like this scene here with the drunk guy. But since in the last movie gripes I did on the 2003 Luther movie where I griped about the kid who committed suicide and the girl who was crippled because they were fictional characters, I think it's only fair that I gripe about this fictional character as well. I don't have to make no confessions. No. My sins are all forgiven. Whatever. Who says so? Pope himself. Where'd you get this? Across the river. I paid good money for it. Tetzel. So help me God, and I'll put a hole in his drum. I put this gripe in the last movie gripes. Luther nailed the theses on the door during the night time, not the daytime. Nailing a notice to the door of the church was not unusual, for this was the customary place to post announcements of both university and public events. Well, at least they got the reasoning right. Among those waiting to be forgiven and blessed, None could know that this document would become one of the most widely read in all history. Just something in Latin. And the language. 
On their way to Leipzig, they actually travelled in two cards. Martin Luther, Melanchthon in one, and Karl Start and all his books in another card. And as tradition goes, uh, Luther had criticised Karl Start for having his massive big library of books and not being able to just remember Bible verses and certain quotes. And on their way there, Karl Start's cart crashed and Karl Start and his books all fell out in the mud. And Luther thought this was a great representation of its earlier criticism. And one more additional gripe for not having this Karl Stard stuck in mud scene in the actual movie. I thought it'd be hilarious. Now I actually like this scene. I think they do it rather well in this movie. They don't do it as so, they don't do it so well in the 2003 Luther movie. But the reason I'm adding a gripe here is because this is last time we see Stalpitz in this movie, and my gripe is that throughout the whole entire movie, he's always referred to as Vicar, and is not once referred to by his name Stalpitz. So sadly, this gets an additional gripe. The time to keep silent has passed, and the time to speak has come. The nobility of our land must set itself against the Pope as a common enemy and destroyer. We have the name of empire, but the Pope is all that is ours. Let him give us back our liberty, honor, body and soul. And that, Your Holiness, is mild compared with this. Freedom from the tyranny of Rome. Every man his own priest before God. Now we shall do some writing. Draw up a condemnation of this man. We shall see how his faith stands up against a papal decree. Your Holiness, we've presumed to prepare a draft. Exerge Domine. This entire scene gets a gripe for the error in date. Uh, the papal bull released by Pope Leo X was distributed on the 15th of June, 1520, before Luther's street treatises were published. However, this scene depicts Luther's street treatises being before the papal bull. However, his street treatises did not come till after the papal bull. His To the Christian Nobility of the German Nation was not published until August that year, the Babylonian captivity of the church did not come out till September that year, and the treatise on Christian liberty did not come out till October that year. And so I'm going to award three additional gripes for each one of those treatises which was dated incorrectly. This gets a gripe because there were no riots in Wittenberg until after Luther had been captured and taken to Wartburg. He will strike them down himself. This is still a house of God. What would you like, sir? Now that's a beard worthy of Knight George. Martin, who gave you permission to return? Nobody. Thank God you've come back. At last we'll have peace in Wittenberg. Peace? What have you done to bring it about? Any of you? Nothing. And as for you, after what you've brought about, there isn't room for you in Wittenberg. Get out of my sight! Uh... Now, this is an interesting fact that I didn't realise, but both movies depict Luther as kicking Karlstad out of Wittenberg when he returns in 1522. However, in reality, Karlstad was not kicked out of Wittenberg by Luther. He remained in Wittenberg until 1523 when he voluntarily left and became the pastor at Ulla Munde to which Luther actually urged him to return to Wittenberg. It wasn't until early 1524 that Luther actually started to preach against Karlstad. And as I did earlier, it's only right that I add this gripe to the 2003 Luther movie as well.
Vicksburg in 1530 was the most important of all attempts to achieve unity within the Roman Church. Duke Frederick was dead and had been succeeded by his brother, John the Steadfast. The monk whose conscience had not permitted him to recant was still an outlaw and could not be in Augsburg to speak for himself. Here Luther is being depicted as being in Wittenberg during the Diet of Augsburg, while in reality he was in Coburg, still in the safety of Saxony, but only a day's horse ride away in case Melanchthon needed some additional help during the Diet of Augsburg. New elector, Duke John, Prince Philip of Hesse. Shall I put my faith in princes? And so the 1953 Martin Luther movie ends up with a total of 22 gripes, which is almost 50% less than the 2003 Luther movie, which was originally 41 gripes, but with the two additional gripes from this movie gripes is now 43 gripes. And if you think I missed anything or you just have any further comments, leave them in the comments below. Don't forget to like and share this video, and if you have any suggestions for further movies that you'd like to see me do in later movie gripes, please leave them in the comments below. And I've been your host, Night Jake. Goodbye, and God bless.